This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God, read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue unlearning the world with Book 2. In Chapter 4, this is Section 1, Delving into Form and Content, Part 2. We talk about the tiny little mad idea where the Son of God remembered not to laugh. He took seriously the silly idea that he could actually separate from his Creator, that he could be the kingpin, that there could be something more than heaven. It is a ridiculous idea. But when taken seriously, the little puff of nothingness tells the mind to run and hide in form. God is abstract, unconditional, infinite light. He is not going to chase you into form. God knows not form. Text chapter 30, section 3 That means the infinite does not look on the finite. The abstract does not look on the specific. This is the trick the ego sets up. Like hiding in the basement. Let's go hide in form. We will make up a world that is a substitute for this infinite abstract light. That is where the mind begins to get bound into form. It is not that the world is inherently evil. It is just being used as a hiding place. The cellar is not a bad place. It is just what it is being used for. It is kind of twisted to run away from a father that loves you. The world was made by the ego for the purpose of hiding. It was made as an attack on God because it was made as a place to hide from God. The good news is that the Holy Spirit instantaneously gives the world a whole new purpose. The Holy Spirit's purpose for the world is to use it to bring peace to mind. You do not want this world you made. Your father loves you. You have everything in heaven. And this is such a tiny little place. You do not ask too much of life, but far too little. Workbook Lesson 133 You are entitled to everything. You are entitled to remember who you are. The mind runs to hide in form and then starts judging and ordering. To forgive the world is to see the false as false. That is what the Holy Spirit says. The ego says that you have done a horrible thing. You have to order and judge. That is where the hierarchy of illusions comes in. The whole point of the ego is to make hierarchies and order. To see differences in situations and scenarios and persons. The ego's focus is on seeing differences. These are the idols, the graven images. This can be a springboard to make clearer 
the distinction between form and content. Content is the miracle. The Holy Spirit's lens of being able to see false as false from above the battleground. Content is nothing more than remembering that it is my decision. My decision in the mind. Form is forgetting that you are a mind. Form is forgetting that you can choose between the ego and the Holy Spirit. Form is thinking you are a tiny little person in a sad, sad world of form. And all you have are choices between illusions. Like where to go, what to see, what to buy, who to date, who to marry and who to divorce. All these seeming choices are on the surface or at the top of the skyscraper, to use our analogy. They are the outcome of all the false beliefs in the mind, leading you like a robo that has no choice but to seemingly follow the demands of the tyrant hiding in the basement. Friend, Guiding the master switch. (laughs) David, guarding the master switch. Do not come down here. (laughs) That gives us a context. Now, what are the situations and issues that you cannot see as specialness? The things that seem to be real issues real problems confronting you. To work it down through the floors of the skyscraper, we have to start where we experience it. At the top. Relationship problems. Problems with the person at work. Financial problems or a flood. You could say, it is easy for me to say, that it is just a perceptual problem. But what if my house was underwater? How would I feel then? Hmm. I would start at the top with the experience and work it back down all the way to the realization that it is just a perceptual problem. Friend, I have this pattern that is getting really tiring. It is like I do not want to give up the ego. The way the Course has painted the picture for me, I can see very clearly the difference between choosing to focus on the light and choosing to run away. I keep running back to the ego's way of doing things as far as specialness and body identification are concerned until I just cannot stand it anymore. Then I will turn to spirit, but after a day or so, it seems that I am ready for more punishment. It is silly. Even though I feel like I can see it for what it is, I just feel very stubborn, kicking and screaming and crying. Go to hell, Holy Spirit. Leave me alone. That is the way I have been feeling for a while. I have a recital coming up, for example, and I do not want to know about peace and love. I just want to do well. It is a very uncomfortable place to be. David Observing behavior can be tormenting. You see the behavior as erratic. You seem to be doing one thing at one moment and then something completely contradicting the next moment. That is intolerable for the mind because the mind in its natural state is whole, integrated and complete. 
The mind feels so fragmented when looking at this behavior and that behavior. It has to be pulled out of the realm of behavior completely. It does seem to be a very big leap to let go of the belief that I am a person and I have choice. It seems like common sense to think that I can choose right now to raise my hand. I can choose now to lower my right hand. These seem to be real choices that I as a person can make. I can choose to go out in the rain. I can choose to stay in from the rain. It seems that these are real decisions. It seems as if the behaviors are the outcome of these decisions. But the decisions are being made way, way back in the mind. We never respond to anything directly. We are always responding to an interpretation of what we are seeing. If a giant bumblebee is flying right at your nose, it seems that you are responding to the bumblebee. If you are walking under an apple tree and you dodge a falling apple, it seems that you are responding to the apple. If your boss is screaming at you and you start to feel your defenses come up, it seems as if you are responding to your boss. But you are responding to your interpretation of the event. The only way out is to change your mind about the interpretation of the event. There will never be a way to find peace by trying to change the event. And isn't that what we all try to do all the time? We strive to have better relationships or to live in better places. We hope for better jobs. It just goes on and on and on. The ego says, Yeah, change the form. You are a person in the world. And if you can just get a better situation, the problem will be solved. Of course, that is just shifting from one idol to another, which is more specialness. It is an endless game of continually trying to change the form. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Friend, but we are not that familiar with content. That is what we need to learn. You cannot make a step until you know there is something there to step on. I think that is the biggest thing for all of us because it seems like the reaction is so automatic. I can see how specialness mixes me up. Without specialness, where would I be? David Of course, the ego's answer is oblivion. The ego says you would be nothing without this world because you have turned your back on God. You have already been kicked out of heaven, the ego says. So you have no other choice but this world of judgment and specialness. But if there are Holy Spirit purposes for the body and the world, and there are ego purposes for the body and the world, and these are decisions that I can make, then the question is whether I choose to give my mind to the ego and specialness or the Holy Spirit. If all my misery comes from giving my mind to the ego's purposes and all my joy and peace comes from giving my mind to the Holy Spirit's purposes, then I have to be able to tell the difference. If I can just begin to tell the difference, then I can begin to withdraw my investment. 
I can check in with the Holy Spirit more often. The Holy Spirit's purpose for the body is simple. The Holy Spirit sees the body only as a means of communication. And because communicating is sharing, it becomes communion. Text, Chapter 6, Section 5 Nice and simple. The Holy Spirit uses the body only for communication. Not for striving and not for attaining some worldly end. It is only for communication. The ego uses the body for attack, for pleasure and for pride. Now we have something to work with. If the ego uses the body for these three things, then all of my guilt continues to be reinforced. The world keeps showing me that I am guilty because I am holding on to the ego's purpose for the body. I am holding on to attack, pleasure and pride. All I have to do is clearly see the insanity of using the body and the world for these three purposes and let them go. If I look at that and think, Oh, oh, my specialness is in trouble here. I'm going to be deprived. I must not see the insanity of it. I clearly have have to have it right in front of my nose. I have to really see the dynamics of what the ego is doing before I would voluntarily say, No more of this. I do not want this anymore. We have to look at the nature of our attachment to all of this. Detachment, on the other hand, is the ability to be the observer. That is really what we want to do. We want to be the observer of the script, rather than get caught up in it. We have to move beyond form. We have to see that the ego uses the body for pride, pleasure and attack. And it does not work to just grit your teeth and try to control your behavior. For example, proclaiming to never yell and scream at anyone again won't get you anywhere. Attempting change at the level of form does not work. Let's bring our discussion back to the level of content. Pride, for example, is very sneaky. Sometimes you arrive home expecting that smile or hug that does not come. Or you look for recognition at work. You just want to be recognized, to stand out from the crowd. You buy a new car or new clothes to get a little attention. Pride is so sneaky. Look at the motivation in the mind. It is vanity. We spend so much time on our bodies, hairstyles, makeup, clothing, cars, etc. Just look at the vanity and how far the pride goes. It always comes down to the body identity. What difference would it make if I were famous or not? What difference would it make how my body looks if I was not first identified as a body? We will continue with the concluding part of this section in tomorrow's episode.